test one, two, three. Okay, cool. Yeah, that way you can lean forward, lean back. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
16. If you have not already done so, please turn down all electronic devices. Turn it off. <laughs> no. Turn down all electronic devices so we have your undivided attention and not to disturb the speakers. Thank you. So good morning. good morning. It is my honor and privilege. My name is Dawn Simpson from Phoenix, Arizona. It is my honor and privilege to be the moderator for this session. So welcome. Uh, welcome to the series of lectures presented by Yahshua the Rock entitled, What is the True Meaning of Ex a Stop? A Scholar. <laughs> Do we have a, the pointer? Where's the pointer? Yes. I'm on my way. Okay. So again, so this is a school. It is not a church. And neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non-denominational, religious and scientific <coughs> research organization dedicated to showing the proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, in the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan that's operating throughout the eternity to this present day. Now, this school was established by a divine vision and divine revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley in the state of Ohio in the year of 1931. The, um, let me just, excuse me, the executive, I gotta have the reader, sorry about that. <laughs> so the executive director of Yahshua the Rock is Dr. John Quates. The president is Gabriel Mays. We hold classes throughout the United States and other various countries, such as Australia, Bahamas, Great Britain, Canada, and other certain foreign countries. Now in this school, we use the true, the correct, and the original name and title, the father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of our Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by the title Lord. The true title of the Word or Son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. The name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Now, Lord and God are both titles. They are not names. The Apostle Paul, who was filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and there are God's many. But we now know that each Lord has a name and each God has a name also. Now, Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. This means it is the title that our creator Yahweh chose for himself. Now, Jesus is a name, but it is the erroneous name of our Savior. Just a minor investigation on your part, and any good dictionary or encyclopedia will prove to you that this letter J does not exist in the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language to this day. Neither was there a letter J in our English language until the 16th century. That's 1,400 years after the Messiah's death. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings of the true and original name of our Father and His Son. Now, Christ is also a title, just like Lord and God. See, Yahweh is pure spirit. In this state, He's incomprehensible and inscrutable. He's the ultimate source, substance, limits and bounds of everything. Now we have Yahweh in his pure spirit state symbolized on these charts as a cloud. Now Yahweh is not a cloud, but he merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself as a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn these clouds all around the edges of these charts to show you that everything on these charts is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. See, Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive, 
perceive of him in this pure spirit state took on shape and form right within himself as Elohim. Now, this is the superincorporeal being. That means it's the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. Now, this form can only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Now, later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body. That's John 1 and 14. And walked the earth plane as Yeshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now, there is only class, how many names? One name unto salvation, and we must know this name. So the simple yet intelligent question to ask yourself is, what was the name of the Savior during that time that he walked the earth plane? Now, our further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Now, also in this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. See, it's called the divine pattern because it's Yahweh's pattern. See, after the children of Israel, after, after Yahweh, Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses on top of Mount Sinai and showed him this tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh then instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. Now, this pattern consists of the most holy place, the holy place, and the court roundabout. These, these three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. Now, in this school, we show forth proof to prove that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern, and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. Now, we have 10 primary constitutional aims and objectives of this class, and they are as follows. First is to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Second is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or the so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the studies of the scriptures, comparative religion, psychology, philosophy, and the modern practical occult science. Fifth is to extirpate the current superstition, the skepticism, and the ignorance. Sixth is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and the ages. Seventh is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, and Satan, and his demons, who's operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which is once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth is to make known that Yahweh, from the beginning, ordained, there is no other name given among men where but man can be saved, save in the name of Yahshua the Messiah. Tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the newer state. Our watchword is peace. Our slogan is we speak the truth. And we will have um, a script. Our scripture today is 2 Thessalonians, first chapter, that will be read by Dr. Gary Myers. Our prayer today will be dedicated by Dr. Lorna Bonner. I didn't have my readers, I dropped them somewhere. <laughs> so, like I said, readers. <laughs> oh, there they are. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, the scripture readers today is Dr. Callie Gagnon. Oh, Gagnon. 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 
<laughs> thank you. And Dr. Maria Winters, so thank you for that. And if we could have our prayer, please. Could we all bar, bow our hearts and minds and give praise to Yahshua the Messiah, who has seen to bless us with being here this today and this weekend, for giving us another opportunity to show his love for us, to learn of his per perfect purpose, pattern, and plan, and um, encourage us to continue. We, we pray that he continues to keep his arms around us. And for that, we are thankful and grateful. And may we all say hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. So we will have um, the announcements. I'm sorry? Oh, thank you. Gary? Can you hear me? Yeah. Can I find those two dots here somewhere? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <clears throat> I'll be reading this morning's scripture reading out of the Holy Name Bible, containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testaments, critically compared with ancient authorities in various manuscripts, revised by A.B. Trana, the Scripture Research Association, Incorporated. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Saul and Silvanus and Timothy unto the assembly of the Thessalonians in Yahweh our Father and our Savior, Yahshua and the Messiah. Grace unto you and peace from Yahweh our Father and our Savior, Yahshua and the Messiah. We are bound to thank Yahweh always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the assemblies of Yahweh. For your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of Yahweh, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of Yahweh, for which ye also suffer. Seeing it is righteous, seeing it is a righteous thing with Yahweh to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When Yahshua the Messiah shall be revealed from heaven, with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not Yahweh, and that obey not the glad tidings of our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of Yahweh and from the glory of his power. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints, his sons, and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our Elohim would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah, may be glorified in you 
and ye in him, according to the grace of our Elohim and our Savior, Yahshua and Messiah. That's Second Thess- Thessalonians chapter 1. Let us all say, Hallelujah. Now we'll move. One, two, three. All right, we'll move forward with our announcements. Okay. Not sure if you can hear me. Okay. We want to announce that we have four first time visitors. How exciting. So let's welcome. Get my reader. We now know how important getting the name right, right? Okay, so let me start off right. <laughs> Okay, our first time visitor, Francie Anderson, Chicago, but a guest of Melissa. So welcome. Yes, welcome. And then we have Kathy Maloney from Green Bay. So welcome. Welcome. And we have Danny Lacoste from Mount Prospect, Illinois. So welcome. And then we have Linda Tucker from Rochelle, Illinois. So let's welcome Linda. Welcome. All right. Exciting. All right, speakers, if you are called to be a speaker, you're given your consent to be videoed for both cable TV and internet. If you do not want to be videoed, please decline the floor when you are called. Speakers, please be obedient to the bell so that everyone has equal floor time. This will be a three speaker format. For each speaker, we'll have 40 to 43 minutes. And it is my honor and privilege thank you to call on our first speaker from Chicago Southside Dr. Michael Johnson
Is okay with that? Senators, not hold three to five minutes. <laughs> oh, no, no. I'm a good listener. My place. <laughs> about this gospel there's uh, in silence and if i could All right, so, yeah, so works for things for a reason. Um, I would like to announce that um, for the events and the directory, Phoenix website housed uh, on our website, and I'd like to share that. Maybe I can put it up here. But we have um, the directory of classes that are maintaining the integrity of the gospel, Matthew 24, 14, classes from around the world, not just the United States. Class from around the world directory is on our website. And I usually list all the events coming up. And if I can, I just you can click on a link and it'll take you right to the registration. So to simplify it, the brothers, if I can share that, we don't want to keep anything for ourselves, right? Sorry for the noise. <laughs> okay, so it is. B M oops sorry about that revealed dot org and it just stands for biblical mysteries revealed dot org B M revealed dot org you can get information if that helps anyone and the whole point is it's only as good as I get feedback so if you're I have the zooms on there we have links. Hi, guys! Hey. Oh, okay, so if you would please hold this right here. Okay. Right up here. Okay, you want to test? Hello? Testing. Okay. This should be over here in the middle. I'm going to just clip it okay. on his tie. I know I'm going to turn cell phones down, please. Okay. Okay, they would like me to announce, please turn down all your cell phones, electronic devices, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm extremely happy to be here, but not on the floor. But I'm praying that Joshua allows me to testify to some of the things that I've learned since coming into this school. Uh, whew. But we're here because this is a result of a divine vision and revelation that was given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the year 1931. Can I have uh, Proverbs 29:18? Proverbs 29 and 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Now, we testify that this school is a result of a divine vision. See, and now we, and we, the founder said this vision came straight from the creator himself. And the creator does have a name. And we have been stressing that name since we came up, since we've been here. See, and that name is Yahweh. Now, one of the things that, uh, now, Yahweh is the name that our, our creator chose for himself. Now, if you look in your Bible, you'll see names like Jeremiah, Obadiah. See, 
and we didn't make these names. Can I erase this? See, we, excuse me. You'll see in the, you'll see like I, they, uh, now I understand we have some first time visitors. So, so I just want to go through this. Now this, you have five vowels in the English language, right? A, E, I, O, U, and then there's another one, sometimes Y. And now, but this is pronounced Isaiah. See, and now you have Jeremiah. Yeah. And what it's testifying to, we didn't I didn't know this before I came up in here. See, that's testifying to the name of Yahweh. Now, we said there were five vowels in I in the English language, and now here you have I N R I. This is what was placed. Let me have John nineteen nineteen. John nineteen nineteen. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. Now Pilate was the governor down in Israel when Yahshua the Messiah was walking around. He was the governor. See, and now when Yahshua was crucified, he had a scroll placed on the crucifix. Read. And the writing was Yahshua of Nazareth. It's the, Yahshua of Nazareth. The king of the Jews. Now the R stands for Rex, which means king. You've heard of Tyrannosaurus Rex? That was the king of the lizards. See? So now, but now the eye, they're saying it's representing Yahshua, but we know that an I and a Y are interchangeable. You follow? So now, and we do this in our, in our when we name people, nicknames. See, and now, if a guy nickname is Bobby, which is a nickname for Robert, but if it's Bobby, it's B-O-B-B-I-Y. If it's a female, it's B-O-B-B-I, right? Tony, T-O-N-Y, for a female, T-O-N-I. So now... The I and the Y are interchangeable. So what we're looking at here is what they're saying, that, that this is representing Yahshua. You can see the similarity in that. See, or you can understand where this is coming from in that language of Latin. But listen, he was not Latin. He was born a Hebrew. See, and now his name had meaning. And I want Matthew 1 and 20. And we want to keep in mind that we're talking about a vision. And what we want to, we want to keep in mind is it was a vision of Yahweh. Or it was a vision given by Yahweh about his purpose, his pattern, and his plan. Read. Matthew 1 and 20. But while he thought on these things. Go to 1 and 19. I'm sorry. Uh, 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example. Well, you're going to have to go to 18. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Genesis 1 and 1. Now the birth of Yahshua the Messiah was on this wise. Now the birth of Yahshua the Messiah was on this wise. Read. When his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, Read. before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. 
Read. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Now, he was going to put her away privately to, uh, because he was a just man. He was going to live according to the law. See, and now she had committed adultery. She, he thought she committed adultery. So now the, the uh, penalty for committing adultery was to be stoned to death. But he didn't want to make her a public example. He was going to put her away privately or secretly. Read. He's going to do it himself. Read. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of Yahweh appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Read. Joseph, you son of David, fear not to take unto you Mary, your wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Now that takes a lot of convincing. <laughs> Read. That a man has got to believe that this is a result of the Holy Spirit, that she's <laughs> pregnant. Read. And she shall bring forth a son. She shall bring forth a son. And you shall call his name Yahshua. Now you shall call his name Yahshua. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. For, because he shall save his people from their sins. See, and that Shua in Hebrew means to save or it means salvation. You follow? So now he was named Yahshua at birth, you follow, and now, but he said this, he said, I am come in my father's name, and now the father's name is Yahweh, see, Yah being the masculine portion of the name, and Shua, see, being the feminine portion of his name, but he's coming in Yah, Yahweh, see, or the masculine portion of his father's name. So now that was, we appreciate that and we understand that. See that he's coming in his father's name. So now his name being Yahshua, but we understand that Yahweh, see we learn this in this school, that Yahweh, see he's spirit. And we cannot comprehend spirit. It is inscrutable and incomprehensible. But Yahweh. See, he took on a definite shape and form known as Yahweh Elohim, and this is the pattern of Yahweh. See, well, I, for a long time, I always thought this was the pattern of Yahweh. You follow? But Yahweh Elohim, he is the archetype or the original pattern of the universe. See, and now, when, when he, had, he had given a dream to Abraham, that he was going to multiply his seed as the stars of the heaven and the sands of the sea. But first, see, that seed had to go down into a land that it knew not of, but Yahweh was going to deliver them out. See, and now from the time, see, that uh, that vision, see, was given or the promise was made, see, 400 years later, Something's got to happen because Yahweh is operating according to a pattern. See, and we want to keep in mind, he's the pattern. See, but now 400 years later, and we never understood that. See, Yahshua the Messiah or Yahshua the son of Nun is going to appear down in the land of Egypt. See, where they were in bondage. Contrary to what I learned, see, uh, in this country, I thought they were down there in the land of Egypt for 400 years, but they weren't. See, it's from the promise that was given to Abraham, see, to the time of salvation appearing, see, down in the land of Egypt in the 400th year, but now they didn't manifest until 30 years later. I'm talking about them coming up out of the land of Egypt. Why is that? Because Yahweh is working according to a pattern. See, and he has, he raises up a child by the name of Moses. And Moses' name means to be drawn out. You follow? So now, being meaning this, he was drawn out, see, of the ark, see, that was placed in the river now by Moses' family. See, and now, and Pharaoh's daughter, see, she takes him out of, the, out of that ark, and she's the one who says, well, I'm going to call him Moses, for he's drawn out. See, but now, oh, 
when they, uh, but now Moses' name, meaning to be drawn out, here's something that, that uh, you've got Moses and you've got Mises, which pretty, means the, pretty much means the same thing. And Moses, meaning he was drawn out of the river. Now you've got this name here. At the same time Moses is going to be down in the land of Egypt, you've got this name here. You've got Ramesses or Ramesses. See, and now what he told folks was he was a god that was drawn out of the sun god, Ra. You follow? But now, so what the, the point is, is that, the point is, is that names had a meaning back here. See, we, we name people now what we feel like it. See? <laughs> But Yahweh gave meaning to those names. But Moses, he's raised in the household of Pharaoh's uh, sister. See, and now when he reaches the age of 40, see, that listen, when he reaches the age of 40, he goes out to see his brethren. He always knew he was a Hebrew, by the way. See, it wasn't like the movie where they find a blanket. How that convinced him. That, that he was a Hebrew because somebody told him, see, that he, he this is your blanket. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, he was circumcised. Now, he was in his mother's house for three months. See, and they said that, you know, that, that he was there for three months. That's when he was placed in the ark. See, but now he was circumcised. And, and we, because he was a Hebrew, starting with Abraham, See, on the eighth day, they had to circumcise him. Why the eighth day? That's representing a new beginning. You got seven days, that's a week, right? The next day is the eighth day. You follow? So now that's all pointing up to, excuse me, what that's pointing up to is a new beginning. See, the circumcision, but him being circumcised on the eighth day, see, he always knew he was a Hebrew. Everybody knew he was a Hebrew. See, but now he was raised in the household of Pharaoh's daughter, and then he sees, or in other words, he sees uh, 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 an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, and he kills that Egyptian, buries him in the sand. See, so you, and that, that's pointing up to some of death. It's going to be a burial, and there's going to be a resurrection. You follow? So now... Uh, Romans 1, 19 and 20, 1 John, I'm sorry, uh, 1, 1 Corinthians 15 and 1. Romans 1 and 19. Read. Because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them. For that which may be known of Yahweh, so there's some things we can know about Yahweh, but we don't know everything. Why? Because Yahweh is eternal. And he's inscrutable and he's incomprehensible. See, but now he does break himself down for us. Read, but in that pattern, read. Is, uh, that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them, for Yahweh has showed it unto them. Read. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Being understood by the things that are made. Listen, he made a man. He tells Moses, let them make me a sanctuary so that I may dwell among them. See, those are things, and he gives David the instructions, see, uh, how to build the temple. So now, and they are all going to be threefold, the man being the head cavity, chest cavity, abdominal cavity, see, the, the tabernacle, see, being a court roundabout, a holy place and a most holy place, and the temple, see, that's going to be a uh, oracle, sanctuary, see, and a court. See, so now, but that's threefold. So 
everything that's testifying to the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Not like I was taught, see, in, in Catholic school, that it's a trinity that you will never understand. Yahweh said we can understand, see, by the things that are made. But we got to look at the things that he commissioned. See, and he commissioned uh, Noah, build me an ark. See, and that ark is going to be a lower story, a middle story, and an upper story. You follow? But it's going to be one ark, just like there was one tabernacle, three parts, see, and one temple, see, three parts, but it's one. So now, excuse me, uh, can I have a glass of water, please? Oof. So now, uh, and I was just enjoying myself. <laughs> Thank you so much. It'll be on the table later. Okay. Uh, at 72 years old, I still, uh, uh, it's, I'm just glad Yahweh brought me in here and uh, is allowing me to see some of the things See that he's shown me or testify to some of the things that he's shown me. So now, uh, but I'm, what I want to talk about is this pattern, and I want to stress that that pattern, see, is him. See, and now we, we got to find out where that pattern comes from. And uh, what time does the bell ring, please? <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> So now, they come up, well, uh, Moses, see, he flees out of here after he kills the Egyptian and buries him in the sand. So you got a death, you got a burial in the sand, and then, listen, and he knew, see? So because it said that, listen, uh, Moses knew that this thing was known, and Pharaoh was looking for him. I never knew that till I came up in here. Why? Because I relied on the Ten Commandment movie. See, they didn't show him, uh, we got to find Moses. You follow? So now, uh, but Moses knowing that thing is known, he flees out. So you've got, and that's likened unto a resurrection. So you got a death, a burial, and a resurrection. First John, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and 1. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received. Now, the gospel means good news. Read. And in which you stand. Read. By which also you are saved, if you keep in memory. Now, we are saved. See, and we are saved from the wrath of Yahweh. You know, that's over in Romans, I think, 5 and 12. See, read. If you keep in memory what I preached on to you. Read. Unless you have believed in vain. Unless you believed in vain. Read. For I delivered unto you, first of all. Now, this is what he received. And he received, he said, first of all, read. That which I also received. How that Yahshua died for our sins. Now, he died. So there's a death. Read. According to the scriptures. According to the scriptures. That's not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's the biography. But the scriptures is what we commonly refer to as the Old Testament. See, from uh, Genesis down through Malachi. That is what we know of as the scriptures. Read. And that he was buried. And that he was buried. So we're talking about a death. We're talking about a burial. Read. And that he rose again. The third day. And that he rose again the third day. So you got to see that with Moses when he's killing, when he killed that Egyptian. See, and now he goes out one day, see, and he kills the Egyptian. See, he buries him in the sand. See, and when he knows that thing is known, he's got to flee up out of there, and that's going to be on the third day. See, and that's going to point up to something, because when Moses is commissioned to go back down into the land of Egypt, he's going to approach Pharaoh and say, let us go a three-day journey. You follow? So now, and then when they come up out of the land of Egypt, see, when they get ready to come up after 10 devastating plagues are poured out, see, um, now I'm jumping ahead because Moses, see, when he flees up out of here and he comes to the wilderness of Sinai, this is in his 40th year. 
See, and now he's out here for a period of 40 more years. See, and at the, 40, at the 80th year of his life, he sees a phenomenal sight. He sees a bush burning and it's not being consumed. Moses is having a vision. You know it's a vision because he's going to say, let me turn aside and see, see what this sight is. So now, if he's looking right at it, why would he turn aside? See, but he's talking about a vision. This is taking place right in Moses' consciousness. I remember in 1975, see, uh, I think it was Dr. Don Emery said from the floor, if you were standing next to Moses, you wouldn't even heard it. And I'm like, that ain't according to the movie. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but, but I, we learn these things coming up in here. See, and he's commissioned to go back down into the land where he knows they're after him. And he gives up excuses. And Yahweh has to tell him, look, Moses, all the people that sought your life are dead. Now go on, go on back down there. See, so he goes back down into the land of Egypt. See, and he declared, and he's given the name out here too. See, he tells him, he said, listen, when I go back down into the land of Egypt, they're going to ask me, what is his name? You know, I never thought to ask that. See, uh, the years I spent in Catholic school, I thought God was a name. I thought it, Big G God. That was his name. You follow? But now, he's going to say, what shall I say unto them? And he tells them, Aya, Asher, Aya, or I will be what I will to be. Moreover, tell them, Yahweh. The Elohim of your fathers has sent me unto you. They didn't know his name. You follow? So now, I mean, even the Hebrews didn't know it. And they called him El Shaddai or El Shaddai, which means almighty provider. See, now Moses goes back down into the land of Egypt with the name. And listen, he's being told, listen, your brother Aaron is on his way to meet you. Moses has not, if he had seen him in 40 years, see He's out here for 40. He don't know what he's looked like. Some of us, we ain't seen each other in two years. And we start looking, what's your name? <laughs> he followed, but now, Moses goes back down there with the name of Yahweh. He declares the name of Yahweh to Ramesses. See, he's even got a name. See, and now, Ramesses said, listen, I don't know Yahweh, and neither will I let the children of Israel go. Ten devastating plagues are poured out. The last two plagues, the plague of stingy, plague of stingy and black darkness, which was a darkness which could be felt. That's powerful. You follow? It was a darkness that could be felt. See, and now the last plague was the, they had to take out a lamb. It had to be a male of the first year. And that lamb, see, is testifying to a symbolic of Yahshua the Messiah. Okay, why? Because he's the lamb slain, see, from the very foundation of the world. See, so now they, uh, but that lamb has to be without spot, has to be without blemish. See, they have to take it out on the 10th, hold it over to the 14th. That's four days. I never knew that till I came up in here. See, that uh, what that's pointing up to with Yahshua being the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, see, and we were told by way of divine vision and revelation that one day with, it's in the Bible though, one day with Yahweh is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. So you've got uh, four days that you're going to hold the lamb over, which is pointing up to 4,000 years. And that's when the Messiah has got to manifest in the earth plan. And that's not why we just, we don't just look at that. See, when he calls Moses up into the mount, he's going to give him a vision see, of the creation. And that we're going to see that that sun is going to uh, be placed in the heavens in that vision on the fourth day. You follow why? Because Yahweh is working by a pattern. In other words, he's got a purpose, he's got a pattern pattern and he's got a plan. He's not like me where I, I got to fix stuff. See, now nah, I made somebody mad. Now nah, I got to go apologize. I got, Yahweh's already got this thing figured out. 
See, and now his uh, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Isaiah, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Read, read. Remember the former things of old. That's why we go back. We want to we want to appreciate and understand that Yahweh. See, He's not just fixing stuff. You know, these, these folks down there on earth, they done really messed up. Let me go fix it. No, it's all He He declared the end from the beginning. Read. For I am Yahweh, and there is none else. Now he said, for he is Yahweh, he's the creator, he's all-powerful. Read. I am Yahweh, and there is none like me. There's none like him. Read. I don't care if you name yourself a god, Ramesses or Ramesses. See, you're not a god. There's none like him. Read. Declaring the end from the beginning. And that's what we're thankful for. He's declaring the end right from the beginning. See, so now getting back to them being down in the land of Egypt, see, and we're talking about that four, see, and now Moses, see, uh, uh, he's down there, see, and now 30 years before the children of Israel, it's be 10 years after Moses uh, flees out of the land of Egypt, see, Yahshua the Messiah is going to appear down in the land of Egypt. And the first time I heard that, I was ready to quit this school. See, uh, there was a, anyway, so, uh, one of the speakers, because the dean had left. See, uh, he had left, he had left the, to go to the Ohio State Convention in 1974. See, and now he was saying that, uh, uh, see, that that man that the world calls Jesus Christ appeared down here in the land of Egypt. See, 10 years before they come out, see, and now that would have, uh, because they could, I'm sorry, when uh, 10 years after Moses flees up out of there, see, that he's going to appear down there and walk around. That was the Messiah that was down there in the land of Egypt with them, walking around looking at the creation. Now, when he comes out, when he brings them out, it's going to be in his 30th year. Why? Because he, Yahweh's working a whole lot. See, but he's working according to a pattern. See, because why? At the 30th year, there's going to be a baptism. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and 1. First Corinthians 10 and 1, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to Yahweh for Israel is that they might be saved. They might, so we're talking about salvation again. Read. Now, I know the topic is the ending of time. Read. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of Yahweh, but not. A... Oh, I'm First so Corinthians sorry. 10 and 1. <laughs> it flipped on me. Thank you, guys. 1 Corinthians 10 and 1. Uh, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. Now, he's telling them, I think one of the speakers talked about that. See here, uh, I can't remember what day it is because I'm old. See, but uh, <laughs> talked about uh, you don't call people ignorant. That, that, those fighting words. But Paul is telling them, listen, I don't want you to be misinformed. I want you to have an understanding. I don't want you to be ignorant. Read. How that all our fathers were under the cloud. Now they were all under the cloud, read. And all passed through the sea. And they all passed through the sea, read. And were all baptized unto Moses. Now in they the were cloud. baptized unto Moses, read. Unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They were baptized in the cloud and in the sea. Guess what? Exodus 14 and 22 says they go through on dry ground. See, you got a baptism that's not about water. And the Messiah, when he comes in, he's going to, or John the Baptist, he's going to say, listen, I indeed baptize you with water, but one that cometh after me, he's going to baptize you, see, with the Holy Spirit and with fire. doesn't mention water. See, and I was talking to some brethren last night, see, about my experience, you know, being baptized as a Roman Catholic. See, and they... I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. They never mention the name. I never questioned. 
I just took it, oh, okay, God, big G God, big L Lord. See, but now, but there was a baptism. There was a, uh, because, see, let me have uh, Galatians uh, 4, where, where see, we, uh, where it says uh, that they were baptized, I'm, I'm, I'm losing it, but it talks about, see, that we are buried with him in baptism. Colossians, Colossians. then. But anyway, that is a burial down here. See, when they're coming through the Red Sea, but they don't get, they don't get wet. See, that, that's what we want to understand because Yahweh has operated death, burial, resurrection, or blood, water, spirit. See, and those are his witnesses, and they are contained within, see, this witness here that he transformed into. See, so now, and you've got the altar of sin sacrifice, which represented the blood placed on the four horns, or there was the death. See, and now you've got the uh, labor where they were baptized. See, that's representing the water. See, in that cup of holy anointing oil. So you've got blood, water, spirit, or death, burial, and resurrection. See, and now they... That's what the children of Israel do. See, and they come out here, see, being led by a phenomenal cloud. See, and that cloud was a pillar of fire by day. I mean, it, it, it was a pillar of a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. See, and now when that cloud led them up, see, out of the land of Egypt, they were following that cloud. See, and now that cloud, see, when it's leading them out, and being it, it was darkness to the Egyptians, and it was light to the Israelites. You know that was a vision. You follow? Because you got two interpretations taking place with the same manifestation. So now they follow that cloud, and now Pharaoh and his hosts are destroyed in the Red Sea, the children of Israel. See, when they get on this side of the Red Sea, which is representing a resurrection, that's the three-day journey Moses kept telling Pharaoh, let us go the three-day journey. You follow? So uh, this is all going according to a pattern. And then they come around this mount. See, and now they're camped around this mount that Yahweh led them to. And Yahweh tells them, see, that he's going to, he tells them to clean up for in three days. Or they come out here and listen, on June 3rd, Yahweh tells them, see, because they listen, they take out that lamb, and I've really um, missed this. See, but uh, all this takes place in April. And you're going to take out uh, a lamb on April 10th, hold it over to April 14th, which chronologically would be tomorrow. You follow? And that's representing the four days, see, representing Yahshua, see, and now. 50 days after, see, they get on 50 days after that takes place, or I'm sorry, 50 days after they get on this side of the Red Sea, see, Yahweh is going to, uh, well, when they get out here, Yahweh is going to make a covenant with them, and that covenant is going to govern every aspect of their life, every aspect. You follow? So now, but we're looking at these things, these natural things, see, to testify to spiritual things. See, and now, 50 days after the Messiah, he, he, uh, he's on the cross for two days on Friday. That's phenomenal. All day Saturday, and then, which makes it the third day come Sunday morning, he rises, rises, you know, first thing Sunday morning, and... 50 days after his resurrection, see, that's going to be what's called uh, Pentecost. And now Pentecost, that's represent Jeremiah 31, 31. And uh, yeah, we, we'll, we'll just stop there. Jeremiah 31, 31, because that's going to represent the new covenant. See, when he was walking around on the earth plane, that wasn't the new covenant. 
See, that, that, that was his biography, and it was under, see, they were still under that old law. And that new law is going to take place on Pentecost. You follow? So now, Jeremiah 31, 31, and then I... Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Read. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith Read. Yahweh. Saith Yahweh, read. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith Yahweh. Read. I will put my law in their inward parts. Now listen, he's going to put his law in their inward parts. Listen, he's the law. It's going to be him in them, not on tables of stone. Because when he calls Moses up, I'm going to cut this up real quick. See, he's going to tell them, see, listen, Moses, you come on up. I'm going to give you tables of stone, commandments, and a law. When he comes back down from the mount, he's got the tables of stone. He's got the commandments written on them. We always ask, where's the law? Moses was given an understanding of this divine tabernacle pattern, which represents the law which represents him because he transformed into this fully furnished tabernacle when Moses goes up into the midst of that cloud. See, and now he's seeing a witness of Yahweh Elohim, and that's what this tabernacle is. It is a witness. See, but the law is Yahweh Elohim, and that's what's got to be written in our hearts and in our minds, and we're praying for that because Pentecost is still going on. I hope somebody answered that. <laughs> there you go. All right. It is my <clears throat> my honor and privilege uh, to call on the next speaker from Lansing, Michigan, Dr. Terry Welsh. Oh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Should I take that? Thank you. <laughs> well, greetings in Yashua. <laughs> Just in case we can get to it, there's a couple of copies in there. We'll see if we can get to those. I sincerely hope you were following what the previous speaker went through and um, I recognize that this teaching does follow that pattern that he's talking about and it's because the Savior Yahshua the Messiah himself established that pattern and created everything before he was in a physical body he created everything by the pattern both the structure and the function which is why the charts are so important because you can visualize, you can see the manifestations of how the pattern works. Now, if we had time, I could show you how every single one of these charts follows that pattern, the threefoldness and the sevenfoldness, okay? Because there's seven steps, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, in three compartments. And that's because that shows him the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all being one spirit, concomitantly existing in three states. Now, I want to make that clear, and I, I said that intentionally. He is not three persons jammed into a container. Okay? And I, I, I'm, I'm trying to be specific. There is a worldwide doctrine with different variants called the Holy Trinity. Okay? Now the word Trinity is a generic term, just means a group of three. But the Holy Trinity refers to God or the Creator or Spirit 
and the nature that mankind has imposed upon their concept of who the Creator is. And if you do some real study, you'll find out there is a Trinity doctrine in almost all major religions worldwide. Not just Abrahamic religions. And by Abrahamic religions, I'm referring to the Christians, the Jews, the Muslims. Okay? And, of course, Christianity is divided into different segments. Not only is there this concept in so-called Abrahamic religions, but also in ancient Far Eastern religions. And the way those things came about was the fact that back, well, let me quickly. Now, I know you can't see clearly everywhere, but way back during, hard to see when you get right up on the charts. Where is, doo -doo 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 -doo. right here, Tower of Babel, okay? <laughs> Way back here, right after Noah's time, okay? Shortly after the flood, it says that the whole earth was of one language, one tongue. And they were together at what people today would call ancient Babylon in Assyria. And... Uh, what happened was they, uh, well, without, I don't have time to go into all the details. They had established a religious system and a concept of deifying or making a man, his wife, and his son to be God on earth. Okay? And it was called Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. Okay? And... That became their concept of the Holy Trinity. Then when Yahweh confused their tongues and they had scattered, they took those concepts with them everywhere in the world. That's why in ancient Far Eastern religions you still have the concepts of Holy Trinity, okay? as well as in the West and in different places because the same thought process the same almost cultural embedding of ideas was carried with everybody worldwide. It became what is called customs and traditions. Okay? Now, I want to get back on the subject. So, Yahweh is one spirit in three states. He's not three persons together. The Holy Trinity doctrine as it's written and expressed in Christianity, is that there are three persons, all of which are God, and none of which are each other. Yep. You figure that one out. <laughs> okay? And by the way, the experts in that will tell you that that's a great mystery. You can't understand it. Which I, I, I understand that you can't understand that. Because <laughs> it is by nature confusion. By the way, what does the word Babylon mean? It means confusion. And that's where the Holy Trinity doctrine came from and is. It's by nature confusion. And the entire world is confused because customs and traditions have started out wrong, so they end up wronger. <laughs> okay? Now, the charts then straighten everything out because they show up correctly the way Yahweh originally had it made and the way he taught it as Yahshua the Messiah. Now, I'm referring to what the previous speaker talked about. If you noticed, he started talking about the name of the Creator. You notice that? Then he went and started talking about the pattern. Then he went and started talking about how Yahshua fulfilled by the pattern. That's threefold. You know why that is important? 
because that is the way Yahweh Elohim showed it in visions. Now, Yahshua the Messiah, when he taught, and there's, I'm not going to take time to get all these scriptures read. And I, by the way, do you think there's a better teacher than Yahshua, the Savior himself? Don't think so. The way he taught well, about himself was to begin at the writings of Moses. Now Moses wrote, and somebody wants to argue, well Moses didn't write all those. Moses dictated and had scribes write. Okay? Yeah, people want to get cute. Moses wrote, that's why we say he's the accredited writer. Not author. The author is the one that had Moses write it. Okay? The first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. But how is it that Moses wrote those things? Moses wrote about the creation of heaven and earth, which occurred 2,520 years before Moses was ever born. Or before Moses received the vision and wrote anything. How did he know anything about that? Somebody says, well, Adam told him. <laughs> Some of this is seven days before Adam is ever cut out of the garden. How did Adam know anything about it? What people have to understand, and it's really clear once you finally get it, is that the Creator Himself had to show somebody and tell them. He was the only one around to know what He did, and there was no one else better to tell or show anybody else than the Creator, Yahshua Himself. Now how does He do that? He gives what's called visions. And you had Proverbs 29 18 read without a prophetic vision, the people perish. And why? In Hosea 4, 16, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because if you don't have the knowledge, if you don't have the vision, you don't really know what the Creator is, all you got is speculation. And your speculation is just as good as your speculation. And I guarantee you, if we sit both of you down at the same place, speculate about the same thing, you're kind of going to come up with two competing concepts. One of the things that one of the things that just floors me, always has, just, to me, just insanity. People will do a Bible study. Have you ever gotten to a Bible study where somebody would sit everybody around and they'd read a, a verse or two or three in the Bible, just a little short passage, and they'd read it, and then they'd say, okay, now, what does that mean to you? And then you'd say, oh, that's so nice. And they'd go, what does that mean to you? Oh, that's just great. And of course, the next time we go, oh, what does that mean to you? You are not going to want to say what she said or what he said. Yeah. Because you get the point, you're not supposed to. You're supposed to have something different in your mind. Did Yahweh inspire those scriptures so that you could have three or three billion competing concepts? He gave a message. He's not arguing with himself. Where do we get so stupid? I mean, really. Okay, now, so here's what the Creator Yahweh Elohim did. He took a man named Moses aside. And he appeared to Moses, and he got Moses' attention, and he both told him and showed him about himself and demonstrated it so Moses had personal experience with it. And that's the way every single one of us is going to learn. Only, as far as the vision part, you're not going to have to have an extrasensory experience. It can be perfectly sensory. And what I mean is, you can see it, you can hear it, you can touch it, but you're going to get the same message that Yahweh Elohim gave from a spirit form. Now, he appeared to Moses, an angel in a burning bush. 
first message that he gave to Moses was his own name. Now he commissioned Moses with the power of knowing that name. Nothing else about Yahweh other than his name and what the power was in his name to go back here and to save the children of Israel out, out of the land of Egypt. The name has the power to save. His name is not a label somebody thought to put on him as if you could put God in a jar and decide how to label the jar for commercial distribution. You understand what I'm saying? Your name for God is no good. I don't care who you are. Okay? Well, that's just what we call him. I don't care what you call him. My question is, what's his name? What's he call himself? Make sense? Now, his name is a direct expression of who he is, what he does, his own nature, and the power in him. It is him expressed. That's his name. The name of Yahweh basically means the one who exists and causes to exist. The name Yahshua is a derivative of the name Yahweh. It's not a separate name. It's a specification of the name Yahweh. And it means that Yahweh is salvation. Meaning, the one that exists and causes to exist is salvation. Now I will tell you this, the one that exists and causes to exist is also damnation. Oh yeah. He has both salvation and damnation or destruction. Which one do you want to personally experience? Because he has all powers. There, and by the way, that's why he's Elohim, not God. Elohim virtually means the all-powerful or the almighty, having all powers. Follow me? God doesn't mean that. Okay? So the one that exists, causes to exist, Yahweh, is the almighty, or Elohim, Savior, Yahshua. So what he did was he gave Moses his name, verbally. He then had Moses put his hand in his bosom, pull it out, and his hand changed right before him from a strong right hand into a leprous plague. Okay? Now, I'm, I'm cutting this up, and I, and I really want to move on. He gave Moses three witnesses about the meaning and the power of his name. He had the rod first. Okay, this is, I'll do this real quick. He says, Moses, what's that in your hand? He says, the rod. Okay? Moses has been using this rod for 40 years. This is not something he broke off a tree earlier that morning. <laughs> that rod is a special rod. It's a very special rod. And there's a reason for it and what's he doing. But Moses is familiar with this thing and he's become masterful at using it. Okay? For herding his sheep, fighting off uh, wild beasts to protect his sheep, that rod can be used for saving his sheep and for destroying others. And he does throw it on the ground. This rod, all of a sudden, for the first time in Moses' experience, becomes a serpent. It's a threat to Moses. That rod that he's depended on to be what he would use for saving and protecting, all of a sudden becomes a deadly threat to him and his sheep. And by the way, that was not a garter snake. Okay? It was a very specific kind of serpent. And you can look this up a little bit later. It was a king cobra. Which is a specific species and different type of cobra than most of the other cobras that are in that area. And the king cobra eats up other cobras. 
And when Moses went back in the land of Egypt, he used that same rod, cast it down in front of Pharaoh. Pharaoh's magicians cast theirs down and they became serpents. And Moses' serpent just swallowed theirs right on up. And when Moses picked it up, he had overcome death and hell in a symbol. Now, that rod then, which was power of, 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 of life, became something that was a threat with the power of death. And Moses then had to obediently handle that in the way he was instructed. And Yahweh said, you pick it up by the tail. Now, snake handlers do pick up serpents by the tail in specific ways. That is not the typical way you handle most snakes. You can, you have to do it in particular ways. But there's a reason and a symbol that's involved with this. Because you read later in the Bible, it says the uh, ancient and the honorable, he is the head. But the prophet that speaks lies, he is the tail. So he's relating a lie with the tail. Right? Now you read over in the book of Revelation that Satan, the great deceiver, in other words, he is the most Powerful and best liar that's ever existed. It says he deceiveth the whole world. Except me, of course. <laughs> no. Everybody has been bit by that boy. Okay? That serpent was cast out of heaven. And it said it was his tail that drew all those stars or angels from heaven and cast them to the earth. They became hooked on Satan's tail, and he dragged them down. You become hooked on a lie, and it'll drag you right to hell. Literally. That's what's symbolized by this. Now, Moses does not understand what Yahweh is taking him through at that moment, but it's going to be in his experience so that Yahweh will then later call it back to his remembrance and make him understand what the message was and why it's important. For example, when Moses is given his next vision, he's up on Mount Sinai, and Yahweh Elohim gives him this vision for 40 days and for 40 nights. In that vision, he sees... Adam and Eve, I'm pointing here, there's larger pictures, but he sees Yahweh Elohim create Adam with Eve in him, so he's creating Adam and Eve together, okay? By the way, her name was Adam to Yahweh. After she was taken out, Adam called her name Eve. To Yahweh, she was Mrs. Adam. Okay, you know, really? Doesn't say Yahweh called anything about Adam and Eve. Okay? Now, uh, he saw them there in the garden. Then on the third and last vision that I'm going to tell you about that Moses went through. He went through three visions. Okay? He saw Adam and Eve there in the garden. And he also saw Satan, that great liar, enter the garden after the Sabbath. Let me make this clear. Satan was not in the garden before the Sabbath. Satan was not in the garden of Eden until after the Sabbath day. Because Satan cannot enter into Yahweh's Sabbath or Yahweh's rest. You go read in the pamphlet called the 40 Days of Blood and Water in the Adamic Transgression Plate. It's in there and other places. So Satan enters the garden after that point, and he immediately goes to Eve, not Adam, and he deceives her. Okay? When Moses sees this in a vision, he writes about that satanic spirit and what does he call him what does Moses write about him at what does he identify him as the serpent 
He says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which Yahweh Elohim had made. Right? Let me make this clear. Moses was not looking at a snake slither around a tree. He was not looking at a snake spit out that little forked tongue and talk to Eve. He saw him as a beautiful angel. But because Yahweh Elohim had already shown Moses something, he was calling back to his remembrance what he had shown him before and showing him a correlation or a comparison with what Yahweh had already shown him. And now he was bringing out to Moses something that Moses is now reporting on. Here's what I mean. First vision near at the burning bush. Didn't Moses see a beautiful angel? Huh? Yes. Burning bush. A bush is normally made of woody material. Right? Okay. Satan appears in the garden to Eve as a beautiful angel. Right? Tree is a woody material. Right? Bush, tree, angel, angel. But then Moses has the rod, throws it down, and it becomes a what? Serpent, which is a threat to Moses and his sheep. Right? So Moses now is looking, when he sees them in the Garden of Eden, and Satan enter in there. This is a better picture. Okay? He is seeing this as a threat. Satan is now threatening their life. Okay? And he goes to the woman, okay, and he deceives her and gets her to sin, and the wages of sin is death. Okay? So Satan kills Eve. Right? And he uses his mouth to do it. He uses what comes out of his mouth. Okay? And she has to hear it and be bitten by it. Okay? She has to accept what Satan tells her. Okay? Now she's stuck with, with the consequences. Okay? Death. So Moses recognizes, oh, huh, that's just like that serpent that appeared down there. That serpent was a danger to my sheep. By the way, what do you call a, a, a female sheep? A U. Spell it. E W E, right? What was in English? What was it that Adam called her? Eve, spell it. The only difference is the V versus the W. Did you realize that the U, the V, and the W in our language all come from the same original character? So Eve was the U in the garden, which the serpent went after to kill. And by the way, He's not only after the you sheep and the you Eve, he's after the you. <laughs> so Moses is seeing and relating some of these things and he's got to write about these things and there is a code of correlations. Okay? <sighs> Taking far too long on this, I'm, but I'm trying to make a quick point here. Should have been made 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Moses had three primary visions. First was here at the burning bush. It's the name of Yahweh that is given to Moses as a message in that burning bush. It's the first time in all of history that anyone has ever given the Creator's personal name and imbued with the power of His name. And it was in the power of that name that they were saved. That is a setup which is fulfilled by Yahshua who comes to earth as Moses came from the wilderness to Egypt and he comes with the name of Yahweh in him. Just like Moses comes to Egypt with the name of Yahweh. And just like Pharaoh said, I don't know Yahweh, neither will I let them go. It was true, he didn't know Yahweh, but he got an introduction. And then he let him go. Follow me? Really. They didn't know Yahshua. 
They did not know the time of their visitation. They did not know that Yahshua was Yahweh the Creator Himself in all of His fullness, meaning the totality of His nature, not the, not the total quantity, but the total quality or nature of Yahweh embodied and manifest. That's Yahshua. This was the fullness, all the fullness, not just the fullness. This was all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And I'm quoting it right out of the Bible. Okay? They didn't know him. They didn't know the time of his visitation. And part of what was such a problem was his name. Okay? That's one of the reasons that those people hated him. Now, oh, I wish I had time to go into all these details. The, the leaders of Yahshua's people, the Jews of that time, hated him for several reasons. One of the reasons was his name. And by that time, their custom had become so twisted about the name of Yahweh that instead of glorifying and praising the name of Yahweh, and as Yahweh instructed them, make no mention of the names of other gods, they had twisted it around to the point where their custom was to make no mention of the name Yahweh. And neither ever let that be heard out of their mouth. And I read a Hebrew scholar saying that no, his name was certainly not Yahshua because no Hebrew of his day would have ever named their child Yahshua. And I got to thinking about it. He's right. He's absolutely right. That's why Yahweh did not say, Joseph, you just pick out whatever name you want for that boy. He said, this is my son. I name him after me. You name him Yahshua. He told it to Mary. He told it to Joseph. And then when they took him to be circumcised, it says that they did that and his name was recorded and it was Yahshua as had been told by the angel. Now, was the angel told him what to name him. A Hebrew man didn't make that decision. That's part of why they hated him. Because he literally came in his father's name. Okay? All right. Now, main point, I just wanted to say this. Sorry. Three main visions. First, at the burning bush. Name. Second, when he's up here 40 days and 40 nights, what he shows Moses during the entire 40 days and nights is this pattern that Michael was talking about. Okay? And he showed Moses how he created everything in this universe by the pattern and made it function by the pattern. That's why everything on these charts is by the pattern. And once you learn that and learn how it works, it like opens right on up. It's a mystery that's no longer a mystery. A mystery is only a mystery that has not yet been revealed. which goes to something I clearly I'm not going to get to in detail. Do you realize that the mystery of Yahweh has been finished? And do you know when and how it was finished? Somebody's going to really get upset about this, but it's, it's a fact, and I can show you, but it'll take a minute. It got finished by Yahweh operating in Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley in his ministry because Yahweh Elohim gave Dr. Kinley the same vision that he gave with all of these visions to Moses, all of the other prophets, and the apostles such as the apostle John who wrote the book of the Revelation. And he made him the seventh angel. It's written about in the book of Revelation. 
And it says, In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of Yahweh should be finished, as he is said by all his servants, the prophets. And Dr. Kinney was serving in the capacity of that seventh angel. Because what he said was, I explained it. You want to see it? Here it is. Now you understand it. It's no mystery any longer. The mystery's finished. Now, to some people, and to me, when I first <laughs> heard about a lot of these things, I thought, man, you're just blaspheming when you say something like that. Do you realize the first time somebody told me, I'll put it like this, it's kind of the way I heard it at first, not the way the word said, that Jesus Christ was back here with Moses. First time I heard that in the class, I thought, y'all gone too darn far now. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but then I had to look at the facts and look at what's in the Bible. And I went, oh my goodness. Now his name wasn't Jesus. His name was Yahshua. That's part of the reason Satan don't want you knowing the name Yahshua. Because the name carries salvation. It undoes the deception. You keep calling him Jesus, no wonder you're confused. And let me tell you this. If you're like traditional Jews and you want to call him Yeshua, you run into the same problem because you're denying that he is Yahshua. Yeshua means he saves. It doesn't tell you who he is. Yahshua means Yahweh saves. Big difference. Anyway, three visions. First name. Second vision pattern. Third vision that Moses had. He showed Moses how he, Yahweh Elohim the creator, who is and always was named Yahshua, just that name wasn't known to everybody. Just like the name Yahweh wasn't known to everybody in the beginning. How he came in at this time, which was 1,500 years later after Moses, roughly, give or take, you know what I'm saying. And fulfilled everything that Moses had written about him by the pattern and those other prophets that wrote. That he, Yahshua, was the reality, the fulfillment of everything that had been written about in the Bible as the Savior. Just an amazing thing. So the name, the pattern, the fulfillment. And that was the path in which he was going. Now, having said that, let's show a little bit about related to the topic, so-called eschatology, which is a compound of two or possibly three words, which I think were all originally from Latin and came through others. The esch means the end or the last. Ology means the study of. Okay? Eschatology means the study of of last things or that which is the end okay and I don't have a lot of time I've got to cut to the chase on a couple of points when people think about eschatology and they look at a plate like the one that's labeled eschatology down there and the one that's labeled eschatology here and they look at the traditional Christian, and that's what this is, you go check this out, this is where these definitions come from, traditional customary Christian concepts of eschatology, those issues deal with such things as judgment, resurrection, death, so forth, okay? There's more involved with it, but the average person when they read about those things in the Bible and even just mention the word revelation, the book of the revelation. What comes to your mind when somebody, and I realize many of you in here, you know better. 
But what is the first thing that just pops into the average person's head when you tell them, yes, yeah, we're going to read the book of Revelation? What comes? The end of the world, right? And smoke and fire and judgment and damnation. Right? Yes, and he uses words like Armageddon. Yep. So I got to tell you this. I figured we wouldn't get too far. That's all right. I got to tell you this. And I, and I mean this 100% clearly. And this is a major confusion. Even for many of us that have been around for years. So please. Please process this. If you're looking for the end of the world. You will never see it. Quit looking for the end of the world. You ain't never going to see it. And by that, what I mean is what we appropriately call the consummation of the universe. The universe materialized from spirit. But it materialized in spirit from the realm of eternity, which is timelessness. It, time didn't begin until quite a period after the universe materialized. You and I think of time as being an endless constant. It isn't. Even Einstein proved that. That's a scientific fact. Time is not an endless constant. Time is a dimension. Time and space are part of this physical creation. Three dimensions of space. Height, width, depth. Three vectors of time. Past, present, future. They all go by the single threefold pattern. Right? Which means they were created. Space and time were created. When the creation goes out, all the created, all of a sudden, gets dematerialized. You will never see the end of the world in the way that people think of the consummation. Now, in terms of the way the Bible talks about the end of the world and other things, and the way Dr. Kinley taught it, I need to make this very clear. And I'm not trying to be cute when I say this. I mean this 100% seriously. The world has already ended. The world ended. The world ended before most of you in this room were born. Well, many of you. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Kinley taught it that way. Now, Dr. Kinley, you know, I gotta say this Dr. Kinley did not teach what many people are accusing Dr. Kinley of teaching about the end of the world. Other people that sat under Dr. Kinley taught those things. You go check it out, you'll find out Dr. Kinley did not teach many of those things. And others in good, I'm sure they did it in good faith in most cases, but they got carried away with a major mistake and a major error and made a terrible mess out of a lot of those things. But Dr. Kinley taught the world ended in 1960. And he taught that until 1975. And the man died February of 76. His last recorded lectures was the end of 1975, December of 1975. He was consistent. The world had ended in 1960. Now, the problem was people thought that the end of the world was the dematerialization of the universe. And I've already told you, you're not going to see the dematerialization of the universe, and I hope you understand why. But when he said the world ended in 1960, he showed how that happened and that the world had ended twice before that. 
Each age was a world. With Noah, the world ended there. There was a flood and a major destruction, right? Now that doesn't mean the globe called the earth. And yes, it's a global structure. Sorry. Some... <laughs> anyway, that was the end of the world. Yes, sir. It says when Yahshua came in, that was once in the end of the world. That the Messiah came and he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's what it says in the Bible. In the end of the world. It says right there, end, over there, end. Now you come on down here, there's another end. Now Dr. Kinley taught about these ends and here's what he was talking about. And I didn't realize this for years and I'll get right down. The world ended before another age started or before another world began. Now, I don't have time to go into detail. The world ended before the waters came to the flood. And it was 53 weeks from the time that that happened anyway until they got into the next world. The world ended here with Yahshua when he was on the cross. And it was 53 days from there until the next world or age ended or came about. The world ended in 1960 and Dr. Kinley said from there on we are in an extended probationary period. Now how many of us understand the probationary periods and what has to happen? Last thing I'm going to say is this. What happened in the probationary period is absolutely essential for you to understand if you're going to understand anything about eschatology. You cannot understand anything about the end of the world unless you understand what happened during the, S the probationary period. And I'm talking about from 1960 up until where you are right now. And that's all happening by the pattern. So I hope that's of encouragement. Praise Yahshua. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> All right. It is my honor and privilege to call on our next speaker from Art Pork, New York, Dr. Bonnie Snyder. What I do? <laughs> oh, did I? What did I say? Did I say something wrong? Okay. Hello. If you're wondering what kind of order this is, so am I. <laughs> I'm very happy and glad to be here. And I'm always happy to testify to the things that I've learned in this school. This is a great teaching. If you're here for your first time, welcome. You've heard so much already. I'm just going to keep right on with the things that he was already talking about. I'm going to try to, I'm going to do the best I can, okay? <laughs> um, I want to get a couple of verses because on these charts here, let's get, uh, let's get let me get a couple of verses first. Let's get um, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, which somebody already got today. We've been getting it this week already. And um, along with that, I'd like you to get me Mark, no, Luke, the 12th chapter. I think it's verse 31. It's either 31 or 32. Read, please. Isaiah 46 and 9. Uh -huh. Remember the 40 former things of old. Now, Yahshua is speaking through the prophet here, and he's saying... Remember the former things of old. Read. Because, you know, this is something you need to recognize. Both of these men have already talked about this this morning. Is The book was put together by a vision and a revelation given to a man. 
the Bible is not the product of a man's mind. It is really the words that the men wrote down that Yahweh told them. And we can go in there and prove it book by book. But we really don't have time to prove everything, okay? So go ahead and read. So we're, this is one, one of the Isaiah here is getting his information from Yahweh, and he's saying what thus saith Yahweh. And I'm going to make a bold statement right now. If you come to this teaching for the first time, you've come for the first time, you've heard what thus saith Yahweh in your whole life. Amen. What? Amen. We'll prove it. See, read. <clears throat> for I am Yahweh, and there is none else. So he, read, read start from the beginning. Sorry. Right. Remember the former things of old. Remember the former things of old. So around here, you're supposed to retain or remember something. And he said, he's saying, remember the former things of old. And the former things of old that he's talking about, that we talk about in this teaching, are the books written by Moses, which are the law, the first books of Moses. And then the prophets from Joshua to Malachi. You're supposed to remember those former things. Read on. For I am Yahweh, and there is none else. That's right, read. I, I, I am Yahweh, and there is none like me. That's right. He's Yahweh. There's none like Yahweh. There's no name like Yahweh. There's, there's no spirit like Yahweh. There's just nothing like Yahweh that you've ever heard in the world. What you hear here is something completely different than what you heard in the world. And you might walk out of here and say, I heard that in my church. And you know what? If you do that, you're a liar. You did not hear what you heard here in your church. See? Read. Declaring the end from the beginning. See, because this is what he does. He declares the end. And this, this topic is so important, eschatology, the study or the teaching of end times. And i just like to say something right now. This is what this teaching has always been about, the teaching of what the end times is. And I'll give you a little example of something that happened to me. You might like it or you don't not like it. Back when I first came to class, and I heard, and it's been a few years, you know. <laughs> I was a kid. <laughs> um, so anyway, the first, I came to class in June. That very first summer, I heard... Uh, you know, they were teaching me things, teaching about the end of the age, teaching things. And I can remember going home one night, and there was a big storm. And the wind was blowing, right? Wind was blowing like crazy. And I got my two little boys that I had at that time, two little boys. And I got in, the, in you know, hiding in there. And you know why? Because I had heard that the end is declared from the beginning. And somebody had taught that week that at the beginning of the age, there was a great, mighty, rushing wind. And I took, I was thinking physical. I was thinking it's going to happen just that way. Everything that I saw in class had happened just that way. And I just thought, this big wind, this is going to be the end of the age. You understand? And so we were teaching the end of the, it's always been part of this teaching. See? that the end is declared at the beginning and that the, there is an end. There's an end to this age that we're in right now. And yeah, I know he's already talked about it ended. But as far as the universal revelation of Yahshua the Messiah, when this thing will be completely finished, see, that's the end of the age. All right. Or the end of where we are right now. So anyway, on this chart you have beginning. So there's, there's at least two places that show you the end from the beginning. Right here you have the beginning, isn't that right? And then you have the whole purpose of Yahweh coming on through here, and then you have the ending. You understand that? So he's showing you just by the chart that everything that's happened, <laughs> everything, that, everything that Yahweh planned to accomplish, all right, is going to happen in this time. See? Even though it's purpose from the beginning, it's going to happen through this time. You also have it here in the circles. And this is great if you look at it. Because you have Yahweh, Elohim, in his creative motion. He's creating things according to the pattern of himself. And look at Right here is the beginning. This is Yahweh, Elohim. Ain't that right? That's your beginning. And this is showing you something, too. Everything comes forth from him. And everything is going to go back into him. And that's his purpose, 
It came from him. It's going to go back in him. There's no other way to go back. And so through here, you're going to find out how it is that you go back. You understand that? You're going to see something in there. All right, so you got your end from the beginning. Now I want to get a couple of verses, and we'll, we'll try to do something here. Let's go, um, let's go back to the scripture reading we had the other day, Matthew 24, 14. And then I want you to get me Ephesians, the first chapter, and start at 10. Matthew, 20, Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Okay, so the gospel's going to be preached through all the world to all nations, and then, after the gospel's preached, then shall the end come. Did you see the word end in there? This is the <laughs> theology of the end times. This is what he's saying the end is going to be like. You understand that? Now read that again, and I'm going to interrupt you. Go ahead, read. And this gospel of the kingdom shall and be... And this gospel of the kingdom. And I just said, I say this every time I'm up, but I can't help it. This is important. When Dr. Kinley taught this verse, and he taught this verse consistently, folks. That's right. This was the, the, the conference, the scripture that we had in 1975 when we went to the international conference. You understand? And it was a lot of them after that, too. See, and this is what he said, and this gospel, and when he talked about that, he'd say, and this gospel that we teach in this school. You understand that? There's a gospel that we teach in this school, the one that he taught. See, how the Yahshua, the Messiah, went through a death, a burial, a resurrection, ascension, and poured out the Holy Spirit. That's the gospel that we preach in this school. And we can prove it because he set it up through the scriptures or those former things of old. You understand that? See? Read. Read it again. Start again. In this gospel and of the... this gospel. Read. Of the kingdom. Of the kingdom of Yahshua. This is the gospel of the kingdom of Yahshua. See? You know, there was another verse I wanted. I want you to get that first. And then we'll go back here. Ephesians 1 and 10. No, I want you to get me Luke. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you. Luke what? 12, 31, or 32. Thank Not you. Sure. <laughs> Luke 12 and 30. Oh, and then we got to do this. we got to go back in there to Isaiah again. But go ahead and read. <laughs> 12 and 31, but rather seek you the kingdom of Yahweh. Now, rather seek you the kingdom of Yahweh. If you're going to be seeking and digging, everybody's looking for something, folks. If you ever thought about looking for something that was worth looking for, seek ye first the kingdom of our Elohim. You understand that? That's something worth looking for. It's an everlasting kingdom. It's going to go on after all this stuff is gone. And whether we believe this stuff is going or not, it's going. You understand? And you're a good example of it. older you get, the downer you go. You're going. You understand that? You're, it's just the way it is. You're going to go. If you ever want to look for something permanent, see, because if Yahshua is resurrected in your heart and mind, you're not going to die again. You're going to be living forever with him. And look at the way that they were up here in the garden. Dr. Kinley explained in perfect peace and harmony and joy and happiness. Isn't that something? That it be, wouldn't that be nice for one day? <laughs> you understand that? We've had little glimpses of it through our lifetime. But this is something that's permanently in Yahshua's presence Every day. And we used to worry, there's a you, there's no you. You know what? When Yahweh's present, it doesn't matter whether there's a you or not. You're so happy being in his presence that you don't even care about what you are. You understand that? It's, it's something. Read. Thank you. But rather seek you, rather seek you the kingdom of Yahweh and seek all these things. Seek you the kingdom and all that, read. And all these things shall be added unto you. That's right, read. Fear not, little flock, 
for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Okay, fear not, little flock. He didn't say fear not, big flock. <laughs> fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure. You know he's got a purpose of a plan, and it's, it's his will and his good pleasure to give you his kingdom. Mm -hmm. See? And I hope I can explain it a little bit as we go on. But it's his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You understand that? Go back to Isaiah and get that pleasure out of there. Um, remember the former things of old. Read. For I am Yahweh and there is none else. That's right, read. I am Yahweh and there is none like me. That's right, read. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. And from ancient times the things that are not yet done he's already spoke about. You understand that? Read. Saying my counsel shall my stand. My counsel or the things that I counsel. My counsel. You know a lot of us and, and probably people are in this room. Counseling, you've got to have a counselor, got to keep your got to get your head straightened out, got to get your issues taken care of, counseling. His counsel is the one that's gonna stand. You understand that? And he has all these things that he's given us, even in this teaching, all these things that he's given us, they counsel us, they they guide us, they help us. The name of Yahshua, it helps you through your day. It's your counsel. Saying his counsel shall stand. Read on. And I will do all my pleasure. And I will do all my pleasure. He's, he's declaring the end from the beginning. And he's, he's, in, and, he's gonna, and he's gonna do all of his pleasure. He's the creator, folks. He's the great Yahweh. He's the one that made everything. He set up a purpose and a pattern and a plan. And he is going to accomplish and do all his pleasure. Do you understand that? And then one of the things he says is, it was his pleasure, little flock, to give you the kingdom. And so do you, can you see how you can bank on that? That's his pleasure, to give you the kingdom. And then you can find out what the kingdom is. And if you look over here, boy, oh boy, look over here. See this kingdom right here? See this kingdom? He says it was his good pleasure to give you this kingdom. This kingdom is these attributes coming on into this shape and form. You understand that? And then he, it's wisdom, his wisdom, his intelligence, his beauty. You understand? Or his knowledge, his beauty, his love, his justice, his. That's what he's going to give you. He's going to give you his spirit. Do you understand that? His, his power, his foundation, his strength. This is what he's going to give you. And look how he did it. He, boy. Okay, don't let me forget what I'm doing. <laughs> That's a good one, isn't it? <laughs> okay, I got to do this. Go back to Matthew. Matthew. I got to do it this way. Go ahead. Back to Matthew. Matthew 24, 14. Read. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. And so this gospel of the kingdom, the one we teach in the school, it's going to be preached in all this age. You understand? From the beginning of the apostles receiving that Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and given the uh, uh, responsibility to go out there and teach. And he, he went and he told them after he resurrected from the dead, go you therefore in all the world and teach the gospel unto all nations. Ain't that right in that what he said right at the beginning of his age? And then he told, they, they, they had the responsibility of going out there and teach him. And he, and at the, in the sixth age, Dr. Kinley at the end of this thing has that vision. It was his responsibility to teach the whole world. Look at, he had a vision in 1931 and he had the responsibility going up against the religious leaders and you read how he did things. You understand that? He stood right up and he told them what was what. You understand? See, and he preached this gospel see, for the 35 or 45 years of his life, you understand? And we keep it just that way because what he taught is what we have. You understand that? It is now our responsibility to teach it just the way that you got it. You understand that way? From him, not from some man. You understand that? See, okay, read. And this gospel of the kingdom, read. 
For a witness unto all nations. It's going to be preached to a, for a witness unto all nations. Read on. And then shall the end so come. So that's one thing that's going to happen before the end comes, you understand. This gospel is going to be preached in all this world for a witness. Ain't that right? And didn't David tell you all them places in the world that this gospel's got to? It's been preached in all the world. So you know that the end is coming. That's a sign, folks. The end of this creation is coming. It's been preached in all this world. You understand that? And I don't want to skip out what the gospel is. But he's already talked about it earlier today. But look at it. It's how you Joshua the Messiah goes through his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, according to these scriptures. You understand that? And if you look right here, I can't breathe either. <laughs> I can't breathe. I can't talk. Okay, anyway. <coughs> so you got down in here, see, the children of Israel, they had to take out a lamb. Ain't that right? That's the death. They had to go through the parted waters of the Red Sea. That's a burial. They come up to worship Yahweh here at this mountain. That's a death. Burial, resurrection. It was pointing out Yahshua's death, burial, resurrection. You come on over here with Abraham and Isaac. Abraham was told to offer up Isaac. Ain't that right? And he did offer him up in his mind. And that's right in Hebrews, you see. So that's a death. Isn't that right? He's dead in Abraham's mind. He's buried in Abraham's mind. The third day the angel comes, stays his hand, and he resurrects from the dead. Death, burial, resurrection from the dead. Isn't that right? Are you with me? This is the gospel of Yahshua the Messiah. This is the gospel of the kingdom of Yahshua. All right? See? And it's right out of the pattern of him. There's a death on this altar. There's a burial with the labor. There's a resurrection with the holy oil. Death, burial, resurrection. See? Pointing out Yahshua the Messiah's death, burial, and resurrection. And look at this. Yahweh's pointing. He, John 1.29. John 1 and 29. Read. The next day, John sees Yahshua coming unto him. and John said, sees Yahshua coming unto him. Read. The next day after the baptism. Read on. And said, Behold, the Lamb of Yahweh. Which he takes, says, Behold, the Lamb of Yahweh. Read. Which takes away the sin of the world. He's saying about a man, Behold, the Lamb of Yahweh, which taketh away the sin of the world. How did he know how to say that? If you look back in the scriptures, the former things of old, you're going to find out back here with Abraham and Isaac, there was a lamb that died. It died instead of Isaac. Back here with the children of Israel, this lamb died so that the children of Israel could escape that death angel that was coming over there. That, that lamb died to take a place. Pl Take the place of their, their dying. See, every day the lambs died back in here. They were a sin offering to take away the sin of the children of Israel. They died so that the sin of Israel, the sinner wouldn't have to die. You understand that? The lamb took the place of the sinner. So that when Yahshua the Messiah comes in and he dies on the cross and he takes away sin, he did that for you and for me. He didn't have sin. He was the only one that ever walked around on the earth playing that didn't have any sin. And if you ever get that in your head, you're going to have something in there. You know that. See? See? Because he didn't have any sin. What you have is he, he went through that death for you so that you could. And that's what the scriptures are showing. The, the lambs died. So that when he's pointed out as the Lamb of Yahweh, that's a death sentence on him right at 30. You understand that? He's going to die. So you got that death. And then he goes to John and he's water baptized. Death, burial in the water, you understand? And then he comes up here and he's tempted or tested of the devil for 40 days. Death, burial, resurrection. You understand that? All pointing out Yahshua's death, burial, resurrection. Death, burial, resurrection. And then there's an ascension. And then there's the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. And that's part of the gospel. Because look at they've already been talking about today. You've got Yahweh. That's pure spirit. Isn't that just about right? Then you got him coming into a super incorporeal shape and form. You with me? Stay with me. All right? Yahweh's pure spirit. Them attributes that we were talking about. And you know you can know a lot about attributes. This is a school. You're going to learn something in here. And you're going to know something when you go out the door. You understand that? So you got Yahweh, pure spirit. Takes on a, and everything on this chart abides within that fiery cloud in the principle of everything abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh's all in all. And that's all. You getting it? That's all there is is Yahweh. See how big Yahweh is? <laughs> He's 
big. <laughs> All right, so Yahweh is pure spirit. Then he takes on this super incorporeal shape and form. And right here, he's known as the creator. Okay, now go to John 1, 1. I know I got a couple verses out there. Stay with me. John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Yahweh, and the Word was Yahweh. In the beginning was this Word, and the Word was with this pure spirit, and it was the spirit. So all these attributes, see, they come into this shape and form right here, and then they're going to manifest in the creation, and they're going to manifest when Yahshua comes down in the flesh. They're, they're going to, all the, all these attributes, look at this. All these attributes, you understand? When he creates the creation, all these attributes, they're imbued right in this creation. You understand that? And then when he comes down in a physical body, they're right in there. You understand that? All them attributes. So everything that he does, you're going to be able to see back to the attributes. You're going to see back to the Father. When you see what Yahshua does, when you see him calm the sea, when you see him heal the sick, when you see him raise the dead, you understand? You're seeing what Yahweh is. See what you're seeing? Yeah. <laughs> See? Read. The same was in the beginning with Yahweh. Uh -huh. All things were made by him. All and without things were made by him. So this one right here is the creator of the universe. And if you look on this chart right here, this says Yahweh. Yahweh Elohim. Yahshua. They're all in one. He said that big word conglomerated together. You understand? They're right there together. All those three. You understand? So you got Yahweh pure spirit. Yahweh taking on this super incorporeal shape and form. Creating the creation according to the pattern of himself. Isn't that right? Stay with me now. Read. All things were made by him and without All him. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. That's why we can boldly stand up here in the moderation and say absolutely nothing escapes the pattern because he's the archetype, original pattern of the universe and absolutely nothing escapes him. You getting this? Read. Uh, not anything was made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. In him was life and that life was light. Go down to 14, please. 14, and the word was made flesh. And, and look at the self same word. I'll get back over there. Sorry. I'm going to die of thirst first. <laughs> Got to wet your whistle. <laughs> Read it again. And the, and the word was made flesh. And, and look at us. this self same spirit comes down in a physical body, a specially prepared body. You understand that? When he said, the, behold, the Lamb of Yahweh, he was made to take on the sin of the world. He took on the sin of the whole world, folks. Yahshua took on the sin of the whole world. Every sin that ever sinned, Yahshua took it on him. Didn't that have to be a specially prepared body? We can't even bear our own. That's one little guy, one little girl. You understand that? And I want to show you something Yahshua showed me. All the sacrifices, and they started sacrificing way back here when they came out of the garden. There were sacrifices with Adam. There were sacrifices with Noah. There were sacrifices with Abraham. There were sacrifices, many sacrifices under the law. All those 4,000 years worth of sacrifices pointed out how big a sacrifice it really was that when Yahshua got up there and died. You see how big that was? That's a huge sacrifice. You understand that? Well, here's another one for you. You're going to like this one, too. <laughs> Every day, something gives up its life so that you can live, even if it's a carrot. It's plucked out of the ground. Ain't that right? You know how many people ate in here today? Almost everybody. That's just this room. Everybody in the world ate. Something sacrificed so that you could live. So every man that's walking around, something was sacrificed. So that they could live. And that's showing you what a great sacrifice it was that Yahshua the Messiah got up on that cross and died. You understand? So that you could live. We can be alive in Yahshua. You're not carnally minded in death after you see these things. You're alive. See? And you're looking at things the way he looks at things. Boy, you have been given something if you're seeing something, anything, the way that he does. If you think his name's important, like he thinks it's important, you know how I, why I, wide-eyed your eyes have become? Yeah. <laughs> you understand that? Because when you walked in the door, 
I can remember the first night I came to class, I argued with him about it. Oh, I don't think the great God of this universe thinks, gives a darn about what you call him. That's what I thought. See? And I never did intend to come back to this class after that first night. But you know what happened? That one Friday night, they were only coming to the horn house once a week then, when that Friday night came, I didn't have a babysitter or nothing. Something got right behind me and pushed me and said, you are going down to that class tonight. <laughs> and that's the honest truth, whether you want to accept it or not. That's what happened to me. See? And I've been sitting right here ever since, taking it all in. <laughs> this is a great teaching. See? Read. Oh, uh. I don't know where you are either. The, we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Okay, so, of grace so these three are really that one great spirit. Then he goes through his death, burial, and resurrection here, you see? And he pours out the Holy Spirit, and that's right here. And so this same spirit, these same attributes that were here, that created the creation, come down to the physical body, and they talked about fulfilling the law and the testimony, and come back to class. We can't talk about everything we know. We can't even remember what we do know. But anyway, <laughs> you, you have, you see, he came in, and he fulfilled that law and testimony, and he took it out of the way. Isn't that right? And that's what he got up on the cross for, was to end that old way of worship and the old covenant and the things were the former things of old. Okay, so he fulfills that. But then he, go, he comes out, and he pours out the Holy Spirit on the day of Con. So the self-same spirit that's in there, he comes out, and he pours that spirit within us on the day of Pentecost. And Pen somebody already said, Pentecost is still going on. It's been going on from the beginning of this age till right now. You understand? Somebody's receiving the Holy Spirit right now. See, that Holy Spirit's being poured out. And it's poured out through the preaching of the gospel. And you believe in that Yahshua the Messiah did the things that he said he did. Yahshua did go through a death, burial, and resurrection. And look what you have as a witness. Even in the earth land, the sun goes down every day. Isn't that just about right? That's Yahshua the Messiah going down. And look here how Yahweh set it up. When this sun comes out of the garden, they go down into darkness. Ain't that right? And the sun in the sky, it goes down into darkness. Isn't that right? And when Yahshua the Messiah was on the cross, and we just seen a witness of it, you see it. The, the amazing thing about that eclipse was it turned dark. What? Did you see that dark? See, it turned dark, and it was a witness that that day that he had turned dark when Yahshua's blood was running out of him into the earth. It was turning dark, see, and then it turned completely dark to three, 12 to 3. See, it was darkness on the face of the earth, you understand? And if we believe the things that Yahshua did, if we believe that he went through a death, burial, and resurrection, boy, get me two, two verses I want you to get me. I got a lot of things in my head still. Okay, uh, uh, Luke 15, 16, or 16, 15. I'm not sure which one that is there. And uh, Luke 15, 16. Yep. And he would fain have filled his belly with husks. Don't read the next one. So Just 16, 15. 16, 15. 16, 15. And he said unto them, You are they which justify yourselves before men. But Yahweh knows your hearts. Okay, where is the... Somebody help me with this. <laughs> Mark, 15, 16. Thank you. Mark 15 and 16. Read. 16, 15? Okay, one more time. <laughs> 16 and 15 of Mark. This is really important. <laughs> you hear me? Read. And he said unto them. And he said unto them. The go. one that got up on the cross that was that big sacrifice. This is what he said unto them. This is what he said unto them. Go you into all the world. Go you into all the world. It's the same thing in Matthew 28. See? Same thing that we usually read. Go you into all the world. Read. And preach the gospel to preach every the gospel. creature. Don't forget what the gospel is. And I want to tell you something else about this gospel. If you look at right here. See? 
everything that happened before Yahshua comes in and goes through his death, burial, and resurrection is testifying that that's what happened. And everything they wrote down and that happened after he goes through his death, burial, and resurrection is testifying that that's what happened. We have to believe that Yahshua died, buried, resurrected, took that sin on him. You understand that? Otherwise, we ain't got a chance. We'd still be in sin if we don't believe that he did it. And that's all you have to do. That's all you have to do is just believe. I read a transcript not too long ago where Dr. Kinley said that. What is it you have to do to be saved? Believe in Yahshua. And this is the way you believe in it. He set up a teaching for you to be learning. You understand that? But keep reading, honey. He that believes and is baptized. Okay, you got to read it over. Okay. Uh, go you into all the world and preach the gospel to go every creature. Go into all the world, preach that gospel to every creature, Jew and Gentile. See, read. He that believes and is Not baptized. Not a preacher, you ain't going to preach to the dog. You understand? Every man, every man, we're, there's no distinction around here what you are. We don't give a dang about that stuff. You can't even remember most of the time. Read. And he that believes and is baptized. And he that believes. What do you have to believe? You understand that? What must you grasp in your mind? You've got to believe that Yahshua did die to take away sin. He died to take away sin. And when you believe that, if you believe that Yahshua and Messiah got up on this cross and died and took away sin, took away the carnal mind, took away the temporary world, took away the old covenant, you see, he took away everything when he died up on there. Ain't that right? If you believe that he did that, you're saved from the wrath of Yahweh, which is coming. You see that? Did I finish the verse? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but mm -hmm. he that believes not shall be damned. He that is bat believes in Yahshua's death, burial, and resurrection is going to be saved, and he that doesn't believe is going to be damned, right? Now let's get the scripture in Thessalonians, please. Thessalonians 2 and 1, or do you want me to? I mean, start one at one? where you need to start. <laughs> Uh, seven, but to you who are troubled, rest. Yeah, that's good. Okay. First Thessal, sorry, second, second Thessalonians 1 and 7. Uh -huh. And to you who are troubled. Now, to you who are troubled. Now, if you're living in this us. world right now, you are troubled. Yes. You who are troubled. But you know what? In Yahshua, we're going to get that too, I hope, before I get down. In Yahshua, we are elevated up above this world and we really live in a realm of his kingdom of righteousness peace and joy and we're in the world but we're not of the world when the world's doing all the things that are pulling you down Yahshua was there holding you up you understand that <laughs> he's a great holder upper <laughs> we need one I just heard some things this weekend of things that people are going through. We need the Savior. He's not going out of business because we can preach. You understand that? That's right. He's the Savior. Read. When Yahshua the Messiah shall be revealed from heaven with mm -hmm. his mighty angels. So if when you who are troubled... Read it again. Yes. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. For you when, who are troubled, rest with us. Read. Thank you. When the Savior, Yahshua, shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. When he's going to be real, revealed at the final revelation of Yahshua the Messiah from heaven. Read. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on In them. In flaming fire, he's going to be revealed. Mm -hmm. In flaming fire. And he's always been a consuming fire. He is a consuming fire. And you've got to be on fire for the truth and have that fire manifest in you to escape the fire of wrath. Read. Taking vengeance on he, them that know not Yahweh. So he's going to take vengeance on them that know not Yahweh. Read. 
and that obey not the gospel and of that our obey Savior. Obey not the gospel. You don't obey that the way you see Yahshua the Messiah is going through his, see that he went through a death, burial, resurrection, and ascension and poured out that Holy Spirit. And the self-same spirit that was within him, it's possible for you to have it. He, it was his good pleasure, folks, to share that, those attributes with you, to give you the kingdom. You understand that? It's his good pleasure to share his attributes with you. It's still a unity. It's just you're in there. Right. See? 1 Corinthians. Yep. 1 Corinthians 12. 13. 12, 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Read. For by one spirit. What? By one spirit. And that's what this teaching is about. It's about this one spirit of Yahweh and what he has accomplished through time. You understand? And it's a round trip. You came out by him, you're going on back just that way. Read. And by one spirit. Read. We are all baptized into one body. We're all there is a baptism. What? Yes, there is a baptism. You're going to be immersed by one spirit. We're all immersed into one body. How does that happen? You come down here and you all get in water and swim around? No. See, you're immersed in every time you come to class. You're going to hear something about Yahweh, Elohim, and Yahshua. You're immersed in the great name of Yahweh. You're immersed in the law and the testimony. You're immersed in the creation that he created. You understand? And that what those things really mean. Listen, I go out on the porch every morning and I breathe because I like to get fresh air into my lungs in the morning because my Anyway, it doesn't matter why. <laughs> so I go out there, and every morning I breathe in, and you know what I'm thinking? <sighs> Yahweh. I see now that his name is Yahweh. That's my breath of life. And I'm standing there. And look at what do I see when I see, think about standing there. We're standing in the holy place. We're standing in Yahshua's. He's feeding us. We're standing in the, he is our intercession. We're standing in the light that he's enlightened right within us. He's illuminated our understanding. He's the light of the world, folks. And we have these simple things that we can just, everyday little things that we do. And they show forth him. Why? Because your mind has been elevated to the point where you're not just concerned about physical, natural things that are happening down here. What you're concerned about is what saith Yahweh and where you're going with him. And I'll tell you where you're going with him. You're going to be going just like he. See, these back here, he's alone by himself. But back here, the sons and the daughters, they're right within him. And that's where we're headed, right back in to where he is. You understand? And that's how you get it. You're immersed in there. Keep reading. Whether we be Jew or Gentile. Read it again. For by one spirit. By this one great spirit of Yahweh, Elohim, and Yahshua. Read. Are we all baptized? Are we all baptized and we're immersed in him? You understand that? You're immersed in the principles of Yahshua. You're immersed in his great spirit. And that's what he has given you. So you're in him and he's in you. Wow. You're in intelligence. You're in knowledge. You understand that? You're in the love of Yahweh, basking in it. Whenever he elevates your mind to where he is, and you've got it there all the time, something bad happens, and I'll just think about Yahshua for a while. You know, pretty soon this, this anyway, read. Keep reading. Into one body. You're all baptized into that one body. That's how you get into Yahshua. Through the preaching of the gospel, and you get into that one body. You understand? Now, one more verse. He's going to ring the bell, so let's go. Ephesians. Ephesians 1 and 10. At the, at, or yeah, go ahead and read. Okay, 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he read might one get, verse up. All right. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. Oh, he made known unto the apostles the mystery of his will. But through Dr. Kinley's teaching, he's also made known unto us down here in this teaching the mystery of his will. And his will is to give you his spirit. Right. What? Right. His will is going to come to pass. Yes, it is. Yahshua the Messiah. <laughs>
All righty. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, yep, I hear it. All right. All right, thank you. So I am happy to report, this is so beautiful, um, the total head count was 290 souls. <laughs> well, more than that. Our YouTube uh, viewers, 102. <laughs> beautiful. Uh, we want to invite everyone to uh, stick around after class for the choir rehearsal today. It's after uh, anyone who may want to participate in the combined choir will be immediately after class. So please come by and sing with us. Um, we also want to invite you to the uh, menu.